Welcome to another amazing episode. I have some coaches announcements before we get started. Now we're into our third week of our giveaway contest on the podcast for the next eight weeks up until the Olympics. So basically August 1st. Now what's happening is that every Friday I go into the reviews on iTunes and I pick a winner. So we've had two winners so far. We're going to go for another one. And actually during this episode, because Catherine Bertine has a book that we're going to promote, if you screenshot this episode and put it up on social media and tag us, you could win uh, one of her books. Now I am giving it away and I want to give it away to somebody who really wants it, but just make sure you, you screenshot us, tag both of us on Instagram, follow us, and you could also be in the running for this book stand is her amazing biography or <laughs> I say biography, but, um, book about the UCI women's racing. And also we have the contest. So don't forget to give us a rating and a review and your name will be there for me to pick from on Friday. So take care and enjoy this episode. All right. Thank you everybody for coming on for another episode of Secrets from the Saddle, all things cycling with your host, Sylvie Deo. And oh my God, oh my God, everybody, you have no idea what kind of interview you guys are in for. I have the amazing Catherine Burton, who has Burton. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, Burton. Catherine Burton. Burton. You got okay. it. Okay. Who just recently released Stand. And okay, before we even get into her bio, I, as you can see, I am not through the whole thing. And there's a reason why, because there's so much amazing information in here i want to say data but information and i'm telling you guys it's not that it's a slow read it's a very entertaining read every sentence that's in here is entertaining and i'm just telling you that because like you don't want to miss a thing i'm and like everything like i okay like i don't even know how she got all this information in here you must have had journals upon journals Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like everybody. So here's the thing. If you're listening to this episode, I want you to screenshot it. I want you to share it on social media with Catherine and myself. Make sure you tag both of us. And I'm going to gift one person, one of these books. Okay. So you have to tag us on social media. So Instagram, um, you can do Twitter, but just do Instagram <laughs> for both of us. So make sure you're following both of us and I'm going to give out one of these, but I'm telling you, it is entertaining. I cannot wait to finish this. Like I had to start, I didn't want to speed read through because like, I don't want to miss a beat. Like, honestly, like this is the whole history about the UCI since 2005. <laughs> UCI raising. Okay. So Catherine Bertine. Uh, is an author, athlete, activist, and documentary filmmaker. During her pro career in cycling, she was a three-time Caribbean champion, six-time national champion of the St. Kitts and Neves, and raced five years on a pro circuit for four UCI domestic, domestic and world tour teams, Calavita, Wiggly, Honda, BMW, and Silence Pro Cycling. She retired from cycling in 2017 and but remains active in advising oh advanced quality and this is uh for pro cycling pro women's cycling. So this is we are going to be diving like right into all of that. You want just like get yourself settled in um Okay, so here's some extra, some additional stuff. Off the bike, Bertine is a filmmaker, activist, journalist, and author of three nonfictional books. One, All the Sundays Yet to Come. Next, As Good as Gold. And the uh, third was Road Less Taken. And fourth, this one, the uh, stand. So, 
<laughs> I'm like, she's gonna kill me. Um, after two uh, here, after two years of labor and love and uh, crowds uh, crowdsourcing adventure, in 2014 she put together a documentary called Half the Road: The Passion Pitfalls and Powers of Women's Professional Cycling was released. It won five film festival, debuted in 60 nations scored international distribution and successfully brought the hammer down on the corruption of and sexism in sports yeah Take that. so you can also find this because i was trying to find it on itunes vimeo um, amazon prime and dvd so if you're like i have to still have to watch it but i saw the trailer um and that's where you can find them Okay, as an advocate for equality in women's sport, Bertine has started the social activism movement, Le Tour Etier, Entier, um, is in effect to bring part parity to women's professional road cycling, starting with the Tour de France. And that's, we're going to be ending off with talking about that. Welcome, Catherine to the podcast. I'm so excited. Oh, thanks for having me, Sylvie. It's great to be here talking with you and your guests today. So thanks for having me. Oh my God. I'm so excited you're here. Like, honestly, when you said yes, I was like, oh. and here's how I got connected with Catherine. Like I had no idea. Um, but I did an episode with Emily Flynn, go check it out she recommended that I talk to Catherine. I'm like, who's this Catherine girl? And she's like, oh, she's done all this stuff. I'm like, I have to talk to this Catherine girl. So here we are. And I always like to start our podcast off with the question or with our uh, guest. How did you get into road cycling? Where were you and what led you there? Yeah. So I have an atypical path of how I got into road cycling. It was via journalism assignments with ESPN. Yeah, and this is back in, in 2006, but technically I didn't actually get on a road bike till 2007, but I was working for ESPN and I was in the midst of a two-year assignment on what it really takes to get to the Olympic Games. And one of the sports that I wanted to try was road cycling. And the reason I wanted to try road cycling was because I had been at that time a triathlete and... Um, I understood how to ride a bike, you know, <laughs> and triathlon yeah. is very different. You're individual. You go from point A to point B, you know, the majority of races are non-draft legal, but I was like, okay, I know how to ride a bike. So let me give this road cycling thing a try. And long story short, when the assignment ended, my love of cycling was just beginning. I just totally fell in love with the sport and I was like, I want to see where this goes. I want to stay in cycling. I wonder if I could make it to the pro ranks because this is amazing, you know? And as I worked my way up through the categories, as you know, in, in US cycling, we've got cat five through cat one where you try to climb through the ranks. Well, back then they only had cat four through cat one for women, you know? So I'm glad there's an extra level now, but um, <laughs> for the know, beginners. Right, exactly. So I'm <laughs> climbing through the ranks and um, I was able to get to category one and I, and therefore I had a number of races where, you know, as we know in the, there are plenty of races that kind of mix the pro amateur fields together a little bit, like pro one, two can race together. So I was, a ra I was racing against these powerhouses and I was like, oh, I want to be like them. Maybe I can get to that level. Wouldn't that be amazing? These were personal goals now, not journalism goals, right? I was like, I love them. And um, it was around that time too, as I'm discovering this love of the sport, you know, my journalism brain is pre-programmed to always ask why, 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 why? You know, so uh -huh. I'm looking around and I'm like, why in this sport of cycling, why don't women have access to all the races? Why do the pro women make so much less in prize money than the men? And then the one that I couldn't understand at all was why are the women's races half the distance of the men's races? Mm -hmm. You know, and coming from the sport of triathlon, not to mention all the other sports I played growing up, that was the big one that made no sense to me. You know, in triathlon, men and women race the same distances. 
Uh, it's yeah. the same course, you know, right. and they have access to that course on the same day and it all works. They're not racing against each other, but the men and women are both there doing their thing together. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, why isn't it like that way in cycling? And um, same thing, you know, when I was growing up, I was a figure skater. Boys and girls had access to the rink. In college, I was a rower. Men and women had crew teams, you know, the, and they they raced the same distance and you know and running men and women run ran together so I, nothing made sense when i got to the cycling world i'm like what's going on here you know the uh and i need to explore that so in the back of my head i was like we need to call attention to this something about this needs to change and i remember thinking maybe if i can get to the pro level that will be ex exceedingly helpful because i can use my voice not just as a pro athlete but also as a journalist so I started looking into, you know, how do you get a pro contract, et cetera. And that's when I was hit with the news that this was back, you know, by the way, this is all taking place. I discovered the bike in 2007 and I was hooked pretty quick. You know, the journalism assignment ended in 2008 and in 2009, it was really when that dream took hold of like, maybe I can go somewhere with this. And so right in 2009, I'm looking at these rules, like, how do I get a pro contract? How does it work? And that's when I read that the UCI um, had a rule back then in 2009, not that long ago, that said, right, right? it's really not that, it's, yeah, it's, it's not very long class. ago. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, why does this rule where women's professional teams can only average the age of 28? I'm like, this doesn't make any sense because I'm looking at some of my heroes in the sport at that time were Kristen Armstrong, you know, multiple gold medal champion, who is well at that point into her mid thirties. And then um, Ina Tutenberg, Dotsie Bausch, amazing athletes, Clara Hughes, right? Yeah, Clara Hughes. <laughs> These incredible women who were well past 30, but thriving. So what's this dumb 28 and under rule? That made no sense. Um, and I'm thinking that has to change. What I didn't realize at the time was maybe I could, I could help be a voice that makes that change happen. But I, it was right. just, I was so dumbfounded by this antiquated view. So that's a little bit about how I got into cycling and where it went. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So that's the start. Cause I could think of some ladies that I've interviewed and they're still well into their racing and later twenties, early thirties still. So I mean, gosh, if you still got the engine, you might as well go if you want to, if you want that lifestyle now. Okay. So this led into your activism and of course I'm going to pull, I'm going to try not to pull. I, there are some stuff in the book. Like I can only go to a certain area. <laughs> then the last part, I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? What happened? And I've got to keep reading. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not getting there fast enough. <laughs> No, that's any author wants a reader to feel something while they're reading. So thank you for, for, Oh my God. Did I feel, I'm just like, <laughs> I can't get there fast enough. There's so much information, but it's so entertaining. Like I say, so taking like at that time you were at, uh, ESPN yep. doing your, your, um, your articles or your journalism. And that's when you were really starting to dive into the female cycling, like the, um, like the, the advocate, like advocating. And ab so talk a little bit about that, because when you, when you left, you started on, you got into your first pro team. Uh, oh, it's actually, is it the same eight, time? Yeah. That would have been around 2012. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing the same, you're working for them and you're racing. Correct. Correct. So how did it all like really take shape? Like, yeah. So 2012 started. was a pivotal year because, um, I was hired back at ESPNW, which was their startup side of, of focusing on women's sports. And I was hired as the, um, senior editor. So for me, that was, and I was writing too, but what was exciting about the position of senior editor was that I got to be a decision maker in terms of what mm -hmm. articles are we putting out there about women. And of course, yes, it was great that we wrote about women in cycling, 
but even better that I could expand that to women who are just doing awesome things in sports that we might not know about, you know, um, like women who are skateboarding professionally in Afghanistan and, you know, women who are dominating open water swimming, you know, things that, and that's what readers love. They loved hearing new stories about amazing athletes in sports that they didn't even know were out there. So for me, I found a lot of joy in being able to highlight these awesome women in sport. And then of course I was able to do that in cycling too and shine a light on, on so many of the women that not only were kick-ass athletes, but now as a professional athlete myself, I also had access to them. You know, I would see them right. in races. I could talk to them freely. I could get their emails and phone numbers and call them up and, you know, interview them. So that was a, that was a big thing in, in 2012. And for me also in 2012, I was 37. So the fact that I landed this contract with Cola Vida Pro Cycling at the age of 37 was a big deal. They were willing to take a chance and they say, hey, we see your results. We see that you're climbing through the ranks. I also help them with some sponsorship investments. And, um, you know, I was brought on to this team. And, you know, at 37, I was having one of my best seasons ever. So that was really exciting to, to have that all come together, you know, thinking, this is awesome. <laughs> it'll, it'll be great. The whole journey. <laughs> I, I know. So I just want to take you back, Catherine, because one of the things that I felt in the book was that you were not given the opportunity to get some of those stories out. Like you were blocked yeah. in a lot of ways from really, from really doing your job. And I've, I was just like, I felt the anger for you, honestly. How did you feel at that time? Cause like, it's like, you know, you work hard to put this together and then it's just like, uh, no, mm, yeah. not this one. Mm, can you That's change it really, about I, I love that you asked that question, Sylvie, because I think it's really important for readers to know that this still does exist in the media. Um, I'm going to preface it too with this. The woman who is editor in chief, which means she's my boss, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I will start with this. She is no longer at ESPNW, but she sure was, you know, when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important too that we remember sometimes in these giant corporations, um, it's people who make decisions, right? Yeah. It's not always that the whole company is corrupt or backward. Sometimes it can just be one person, but at the same time, that company needs to take ownership and be like, oh, yeah, oh, okay, we need to improve this, or that person didn't do it right, you know, so where I'm going with that, now I'll backtrack to explain that situation, um, you know, on one hand, too, I also want to say I'm very, very, very thankful to ESPN for giving me this opportunity to be a journalist with them, and to mm -hmm. have this incredible assignment that led to my cycling career, I am always very pro ESPN when it comes to what they've done for me. Right. Um, when I got into the ESPN W side, I did have this woman who was above me who um, was turning down stories that I fully believe need to be written. You know, um, and keep in mind too, that in my role, yes, I did write some of these stories, but it was also my job to outsource the stories to other writers. Um, and that's very important to know because it wasn't that it was just my writing that was getting blocked, but it was the ideas and writing of other women too. Um, mm -hmm. And where this happened was specifically one article that I was personally working on was transgender athletes in cycling. Yeah, I agree um, with and, that. right. And keep in mind, this is 2012. Yeah. It really wasn't a subject that people were writing about. And I had been in many races with a woman who was trans, a, a transgender athlete. And, um, and I, I felt it was a very important topic that we needed to talk about, that we needed to discuss. And that article got squashed, you know, no, we're not gonna write about this. That was her, you know, her block. Um, another one that came up was writing about um, depression, um, about postpartum depression, another one, 
about athletes, about suicide, you know, I was willing to, oh, to wow. I thought it was very important to highlight that not everything is sunshine and rainbows in sport, but mm -hmm. let's put that out there and let's, let's put those articles on the table for people to understand and learn and read. Um, but this particular editor was really in the mindset that she wanted smiley, happy athletes, sunshine and ra rainbows, women's sports is great and only great, you know, a <laughs> little bit of an antiquated view there. And um, so these stories kept getting blocked, you know, and, and stories again, that were very, very important. I felt for, mm -hmm. you know, for everything, for just, if you're a journalist, it's, it's your job to print the truth, right? Right. The good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between. Um, so that was, that was tough for me seeing like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are ESPN. We have the power to help create change, to help give exposure. And it wasn't happening. And, um, that kind of clued me in that something was a little bit off and antiquated at that point. Mm -hmm. I often wonder, like, if you had a great article, could you not have pitched that to another cycling like uh, article, like a um, yeah. magazine or, well, there wasn't blogs back then, but like magazines. Well, you could absolutely. But for me, the importance of getting it in front of ESPN was the larger reader base, taking right. it outside the cycling world and into mainstream media, because that's oh, how you're okay. going to grow any sport. So um, that, you know, and that was what was most important. And actually my third book, um, The Road Less Taken, is a compilation of all of the essays that I wrote during my ESPN career. Really? And, oh yeah, and including the ones that didn't get published. Oh my gosh. Right? So right. that's, that's out that there. Because <laughs> I'm like, look, you can say ESPN doesn't want to run it, but I can run it, you know, in my own format. Yeah. So yeah, so that's what, that's how that went. Oh my gosh, okay, so everybody go pick that one up. Yeah. So it's a compilation of, of short stories or short articles. Short articles. It's yeah, exactly. Cool. Oh my gosh. Okay. Cause yeah. I was often thought it was just like, what? Yes. <laughs> like that, mm -mm. you mm -hmm. know, keep it clean. Right. Uh, now yeah. here, but so now then moving into, um, moving forward, getting into your pro cycling uh, career. So this is where, like, it's kind of like two things. So getting into your career, and this is where I want to ask you about the big differences between men and women. Yeah. Like, um, and I don't even know where that would start. Would it start with like, um, contract? <laughs> I said I wasn't going to do that, <laughs> but what does it, okay. Can you name out the big different, I, we kind of all know the big differences, but the differences that are not in our faces that like the average person would not know about. Yeah. That's kind of behind so, closed doors, right? That nobody talks about. Right, right, right. So we mentioned the big ones are that women don't have equal opportunity to many of the races that yeah. when they do have opportunity that they don't have the same distance and for the professionals that they don't have the same prize purse. Those are the big three. I would mm -hmm. say the fourth, and also in many ways, the most, um, the, the biggest of them all is the media exposure. Um, I think oh, a lot God. of people, yeah, and a lot of people in this day and age assume that women are equal, everything's okay. And a lot of people actually think that women have their own Tour de France because they must, because the men do. So surely the women have their own race. It must be on TV somewhere, you know, but it's not, right? And these are the, the loopholes. It might of, be. But yeah. <laughs> find it. It's like, I right. want woman cycling. Is there anything? No. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So people are under this false assumption, like, oh, it's 2021. Everything's got to be equal. And it's not until we unearth and highlight in the public that these inequities still exist, right? And at, that's the biggest one is that the media exposure, we are still in this place where, um, you know, the race slash the race director is the one in charge of selling media rights to, to cover that race. 
So what we're seeing is, you know, whether it's, you know, the big ones that we're kind of used to in North America, like Tour of California or mm -hmm. the Tour de France, um, these races, you would see, like, you could see up to three, four, sometimes even the full six hours of a race on TV for the men. And then they'll highlight an actual 30 second clip of the women at the very end, right? And that's not yeah. okay. <laughs> that's such a stark imbalance, right? And so it's about making sure that the, the media exposure is very much equal. And that comes down to targeting not just the race directors, but also the sponsors and saying, hey, you know, what are you doing? Showing only this amount. If you have a, um, let's say a four hour TV block, then it needs to be two hours of the men, two hours of the women. And that's what has to happen. So, um, we're, we're getting there, but the amount of energy it takes to call out this stuff and put it in the media so that other people know that this inequity exists, it's a mm -hmm. lot of work, right? But we're on oh, it, we're on it, but we need everyone to kind of take, take that ownership and be like, oh, I, I want to see this, you know? And then there's that fallback excuse of, oh, well, does anyone even watch women cycling? And the answer is how can they watch what they can't see, you know? Yes. So yeah, don't exactly. Tell me that that's just bullshit. Right. You know? <laughs> Where's the woman's race? I'm like, I don't want to watch three minutes. I want to see the whole thing. Exactly. And you know, most fans of sport, when we're talking about the highest level of any sport, um, fans want to watch both. You know, we see this. Uh, tennis is one of the best examples. If you turn on a pro tennis match, whether it's men or women the entire audience is an equal split of men and women who are, you know, who want to see that happen. So that's, yeah. you know, it's obvious. It's obvious that, yeah. So what about, so there's the race. So, so, so it's the media part. And I get that because it takes a lot of money to get one of these races of that magnitude done. Yeah. Um, as a race organizer of a very small time trial, <laughs> I get that there, there's not a whole lot to be taken care of for my, I didn't need the porta potties, which is the biggest expense. Sometimes. Right. But, <laughs> but so let's dive into like more, cause I want to know, like when you think about everything um, that needs to go in to a tour, and um, I was listening to Mike Woods talk about this. He's talk about environmentally friendly. Um, oh, look at that. We have a guest. She's been meowing at the door. So I had to Oh, let has she? Just like, yeah. let me. All right. I am listening. Please go on. <laughs> but so there's the background. So he, so, so we got the media, which is at the top. Then we have the distance. Now let's talk about the income based on men and women because i i have a friend who raised pro and she told me what her salary was which i was like wow um but let's talk about that first because then i have you know the team support like all the way to swing yours like the 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 um uh, sd was it's a support Dur uh, 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 director sportif, sportif. Yes, yes yeah director uh, ds the director sportif plus like you know the accommodations and all that stuff so how does that compare to you know men so men women let's talk salary first and then we'll go down the the chain yeah of so there are two sources of income in pro cycling and one is the salary and the other is the prize money and both are pretty different. We've luckily, uh, we've been lobbying for years about an equal base salary to happen at the women's world tour level, which again is the top level of the sport. And finally, after you know seven years of pestering the UCI, they actually agreed that women finally deserve a base salary. Um, and that what is the base salary. Yeah. So the base salary <laughs> went into effect in 2020 and will be um, at its highest point in 2023. They're taking three years to build it to full equity. And um, I believe it comes out to, I'm going to have to check the exact numbers, but it's roughly 35,000 euro. 
um, something okay. in that realm. I have to check again at the, what it will be, but they, it started at like 15 K for the first year, then went up to 20, 25 K and then we'll eventually be in the, the low thirties. Um, so that's both very good and also a little disconcerting because the women's world tour base salary will be equal to the men's pro continental salary and the men's pro conti teams are the are also professional but they're more of the minor league to the major league status so that needs a little bit of tweaking to make it fully equal but finally we have something in place that's moving forward um and what's interesting and also very, very important about this is that, you know, when I was racing, there was no base salary set in place. And what would often happen is that the directors would use that as a bargaining chip. You know, they would lowball the riders and say, look, um, here's what I can give you for the year. Sometimes it would be low or even under $10,000. Um, and it, the idea was like, look, you can accept this this is your salary or, and if you don't want it, I'll find someone who does, you know, I know you can't that that'd be like, well, I just want yeah. to race. Right. Yeah. And, and this is where women exactly. And women have to step up and be part of that solution too, you know, um, in terms of forming a union. So like, no, it's not okay to perpetuate this idea that you're only worth $10,000 when your male counterpart is worth a minimum of 35 K like, no, that's not all right. Um, and it, it's it that then turns the corner and becomes a very social and you know societal uh, example of what's wrong when when we're trying to fight for equality. Sometimes um, you know the women can inadvertently or sometimes advertently hold them hold back women, right? And right. yeah, you know I like to I think it's very important to be transparent. So in the five years that I raced professionally only one of those five years was I paid above the poverty line. And my biggest year of earning was a $25,000 salary, which to me felt like it had three zeros tacked on the end of it, you know, after all the mm -hmm. other years. But it also meant that I had to carry a part-time job in addition to the 25K. Well, yeah. Yeah. So that's, I have that at the end because um, if you're, so, okay. So if you're out racing and you're committed to a, a team, a pro team, you've signed with them. I always thought that the salary was okay. So the UCI has to force the team, the pro team to pay to find enough money to pay their riders the minimum. So if it's like, 12,000, everybody gets 12,000 times 10 riders, mm -hmm. right? So they have to right. find that much money to make their budget right. work. Pretty much. Yep. Okay. Exactly. But that's also very, very doable. And by the way, this is only at the world tour level. So we have to remember that UCI has two different tiers for the women, you know, the, the world tour and then which really only has about 10 teams at the world tour level. And under that you have what's kind of this pro continental level. That's where the UCI needs to step up. What we really need is a three tier system where you have major leagues, minor leagues and development league, you know, kind of like if, if we look at baseball, they have major league, then they've got triple a double a single a, and there's that incentive that you work your way up and you right, know the guys right. who are in you know let's say double double a major league baseball they are not making the big bucks but there's a pathway in place where they get you know a small salary but they know that ahead of them there are there's a ladder right a, an effective ladder and that ladder does not exist in the women's side of the sport and in some ways the men's side too and that can and should be done with a three-tiered system. I'd love to see a four-tier system. Um, it's one thing, you know, if you're in the development pro ranks, if you also have to carry a part-time job. Oh my gosh. Okay, so Catherine just disappeared. <laughs> and, oh, she's come back. Oh, there. <laughs> oh no, you're muted. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm not sure what happened there. We I don't know, but you were just, you were just talked about the four tier and then you like went all like crazy and then disappeared. So you're going to okay. have to repeat that. So four tier. It would be great if we had a four tier system where, you know, it was, um, uh, professional and then you have like almost like major league, minor league, development league. I think there should actually be two levels of development league. Um, so that there's a clear ladder of working up the ranks of the professional side of the sport. So if you were to put that into context, like, so mm -hmm. pro would be like Tour de France pro. That like, would be world tour. And that's what we have. We oh, that's have world, world tour. tour. Okay. Yeah. So there's nothing above world tour. Like no, that's where tour. everybody wants to go right there. Right. And then below that, is that more national? No, that would be called pro continental. And that's what they have on the men's side. And it's kind of on the women's side, but it's this giant, giant category that, um, oh. that we don't actually have. Hold on, hold on one second. Okay. I'm one second. I'm going to have to relocate for a minute. Oh no. <laughs> okay. So that would, that would actually be very difficult to, uh, you know, to have, it's just, it's a real kind of pain in the butt that that structure doesn't exist where we right. have both, you know, a feeder system to the next. Right. And like that's a, where I was like making farm me. teams kind of thing. Exactly. We need the farm teams. And that's where I was saying, and I don't know if this part got cut off, but it was when you are actually um, in the, the minors, similar to baseball, if you were in, uh, you know, triple A, double A, single A, you at least have a pathway toward major league baseball. And yeah, I think it's same in hockey and hockey. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So to have that I'm shifting back into the light now. <laughs> so to have that would be amazing and very beneficial because if you think about it, um, the, you know, it's the farm teams that are actually the most vital and the most important because that's where all the pro teams are looking to gain right. the next riders. Right. It moves the whole sport forward. So, right. yeah. So if you were to have, so say, and this is something I was thinking about, because if I start, if I were to start and that, I was telling you, this is kind of my passion project is to start a junior development team, which would then a feed into a national mm -hmm. woman's pro team. Or, and see, this is where I was kind of fuzzy, right? And this is not what all, we're not going to get deep into this, but it was, what is the steps for my riders moving forward? Like if I'm going to develop them at this stage, what's the next stage for them? And then what's the next stage after that? Do you know what I mean? I do. I do. And that is, if you have development riders, um, then and making the, uh, or at least letting know, I would say one of the most important things you can do is have a direct communication with the Canadian national team as yeah. well as with the pro teams and let those teams know that you exist. Let them know right. who your athletes are, who your rosters are. And of course, many of the pro teams do keep an eye on the results, you know, the race right. results. Um, and also to educate your riders on what's out there that yes there's the, the national team there's the potential track toward the olympics and here are all these pro teams and if you want to get to these places this is where you hone your skills this is where you learn how not just how racing works but how the sport works yeah you, know, you can be instrumental in creating an awareness about cycling and you can also weave into that here are the parts of the sport that are great and here are the parts of the sport that need to be fixed and your voice <laughs> yeah. can help fix these parts, you know? Yeah, because it was really interesting. Um, and we both know Emily Flynn. She went yeah. through your homestead foundation and okay. she was yeah. talk. she talked a lot about that whole process of finding and um, applying yeah. for a pro team. Like I had no clue that that was like, you know, you didn't get picked up. Like, you know, right. I've only seen what happens around me in my little bubble in Ottawa mm -hmm. here, um, Ottawa and Quebec. And so, and I have heard like kids being 
picked up for the national team and other teams. And I was just always like, how does that happen? Like they just get uh, approached one day, but no, like it's an application system yeah, or a process for a lot of them. It's a process. Exactly. I mean, results speak for themselves on one level. Yeah. Um, but if athletes want to get on a pro team, they have to show that that's what they want. They have to apply to the races. They have to, you know, um, make sure that this is a path and a lifestyle that they want to get into mm -hmm. because just because somebody is strong and might have a few good results, um, maybe they don't know what it means to be a team player. Maybe they don't know what it means, yeah. uh, you know, to step into the arena of, of, um, being fully professional. And that's where, you know, that's where the education part has to come into play for sure. Yeah, exactly. And the athletes have to, yeah. you know, when, and even, even the men's side of the sport, it's not like hockey and baseball and football and basketball, where there are actually recruiters, like paid recruiters who go to mm -hmm. races and, you know, high schools and colleges that doesn't exist in cycling. There are no paid recruiters. No. Right. So, um, that's where the athlete in cycling has to take the initiative to be like, this is what I want to do. How do I get there? How do I apply? So yeah, that's, that's part of the system. Yeah, I have noticed that like, it's always kind of like, it's the last sport that people are looking like thinking about okay. to join uh, professionally because like literally you have to go recruit out of other sports. To Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I've noticed now. Okay, so back to the question of, of the equalness between a men's pro team and a women's pro team, because of course we've all seen the Tour de France because that's what's in our face all the time. And you know, the Giro is happening right now. Now the, like the whole setup afterwards, like the recovery, the massage, the, the, and the, um, the, uh, I want to take the food, the, the, the soigneur, the soigneurs. Yeah. Everybody takes care of like, is that equal on the other side, like with women or is uh, it cut in half or yeah, the high level world teams, you do need all those factors in play. And there are some world teams that are doing it right. You know, that right. have the proper um, staff, really. They have the yes, right staff. I guess that's what they are. Yeah. You know, Trek Segafredo does it right. Um, you know, there are about, I want to say, seven or eight of the world tour men's teams that have a women's counterpart, you know, like Team Sunweb. Oh uh again trek segafredo movistar See, that's the way it should every team should yeah. have a female team attached yeah, to it at that level exactly because we do have uh -huh. the talents and the ability so at the very highest level yes the the women are getting the um the same treatment um but the problem is that's very few and and rare you know so yeah it's happening for a few teams but it's not happening for enough teams um, and I know even on some of those teams, um, you know, maybe they are paying the base salary, but they're still not augmenting salaries on top of that, where they are for the women, for the men's side of the sport, you know, just because everyone gets a bit, gets a base salary doesn't mean that these men aren't making multi-millions, you know? And so, um, on the women's side, that's very rare. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. I think that is the story. <laughs> that is the story. Yeah. That is the story. Yeah. Now, yeah. is that is that because they go ahead and have their own endorsements for their own products or are endorsed by other products that they are making more money because they're in the media more? Um, yes and no. Uh private and personal endorsements are interesting in cycling. Um, it does happen by are they allowed. It's allowed if you're not, if it doesn't contradict with a team sponsor, right? right? Yeah. So um, that's where it has to get, get creative, you know, um, you know, and I can think back in the day, um, you know, when in North America, when Lance Armstrong was all the rage, did we see him in like Michelob commercials and, you know, or, or, you know, endorsing a product like that, which isn't necessarily connected to his cycling team yes so those types of sponsorships exist and they're out there but again i just had to go back you know almost 15 years in the sport 
for that example of how frequently it happens. You know, if Armstrong right. was the last one that we saw doing national endorsement campaigns, then it's pretty safe to say that no, that's not happening in cycling <laughs> um, it, to, to that extent for either men or women. And maybe that's different in Europe. It's very possible that it is, but at least in North America, we, we very rarely see a cyclist step into that level of endorsement. Hmm. I think that's a serious side hustle if you're going to do something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's that's a job in itself. I mean, and that that leads me to my other question is having extra side hustles to be able to make ends meet while you're working mm -hmm. as a cyclist because you know, like a cycling season is let's say 10 months. I guess with two it months is, off. It is the that. actual race season. Um, I, I would say, yeah, maybe you're only even racing nine months, you know, let's say January through September and worlds is always at the end of September. If you're at that level where you're going to worlds, that's, that's a full, yeah. I mean, that is 10 months by the end of September. That's, yeah. that's exhausting. And then of course you have to be uh, you have to keep in shape you have to rest you have to train it's 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 a full-time job you know all all around so for um for men to be able to have a salary which doesn't require them to do anything else you know standing on their feet or anything of anything well, at all yeah yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wasn't I was talking crazy. like a physical you're talking a physical job and job. When I I'm talking like well you know like people have well, you can do anything off the internet now. You can, but it's still, then you're still also using your mind, you know, um, and you have to build time into your schedule to do your job, whatever it is. And it, it is not okay for one gender to have to do it simply because they're not being paid the same, know, right? But yeah. Like, I mean, how I do you survive you on a thousand bucks a month? Oh, it's, it's not, it's not easy. You know, when I was in, let's see, 2016, I was racing for the world tour team silence. My salary was 25 K, but I still needed extra income just, you know, cause that's very low. Um, I worked part-time at El Grupo youth cycling and gosh, at, by the end of the year, let's say I was making maybe 40 K and I felt like I was rich. I was like, that's right. the, the most I've ever made in a combined year of, but again, I was also working. Like I had to, you know, and I love those kids. So I love riding with the kids, but I was either on my feet, on the bike or working administrative hours in their office. Um, right. When as a professional athlete, it would have been a lot more conducive to resting, sleeping, eating yeah. properly, you know, um, so yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a wild thing that that the whole reason that that happened. Um, and I had to do that was because I was a woman, <laughs> had I been a man, I would have been paid more. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I was kind of wondering, cause like I said, when I was talking to a couple of girls, like they're like, no, I don't have time. Um, and then I talked to Lex and she's like, yeah, I had a bit of a side hustle cause I had to. Yeah. Um, and she said, but it was really hard. I was like, okay. Like, I, yep. yeah, I guess it's, it's like a physically exhausting and demanding. To, Mentally too, you know, to apply. Yeah, I can't say like to ride your bike, but yeah. like, you're not just riding your bike no. for like half an hour. <laughs> I no. Don't, no. No. So, <laughs> all right. So this, this, now we're going to move into, I think I got all my questions answered. Awesome. Now, yeah. <laughs> now I love it that you went and, um, found your own sponsor, uh, through a friend. Uh, yeah. And, and that was, uh, Cola Vita, um, oils and pasta. Oh, okay. So Cola Vita was its own pro cycling team before you. Oh yeah. Yeah. That one's been around for about 17 years. I helped oh, bring wow. okay. sponsors to Cola Vida to help augment the, the team's, um, you know, co-sponsors, but yeah, Cola Vida had been around for, in fact, they're one of the longest running pro teams in, in the sport. So kudos to Cola Vida for, for going, you know, above and beyond the distance there. 
I helped bring some co-sponsors to the team so that they could. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I was saying, cause that was a big, one of your biggest experiences and probably I think your last before, no, because, all right, let's back up. You decided somewhere in there to start putting your documentary together. Um, yeah. Yeah. The uh, road half. Half the road. Yes. Half the road. And um, so, yeah, so that was in 2012. Yeah. Well, when yeah, it, that's when I started filming and it was, that was two years of, of uh, love and labor till it actually came out in 2014. But yes, it started in 2012. So talk, talk about how that got started and how you decided that this was the best, obviously it's the best way of putting together a video and like all the aspects that you captured. I mean, I saw a little bit of it in the trail and I'm going to go trailer and I'm going to go find the full thing. I'm like, full where film. Yep. The yeah, full film. Yeah. Um, but talk about that because that is kind yeah. of you were filming that at the time that you were racing with Call of Vita mm -hmm. and, um, and that brought about some, I guess, some conflict within the team. Yeah. <laughs> it, within, <laughs> within the, within the director, the team was within the great. director. Sorry. Within not the director, the the, my, my fellow teammates, the riders, they were awesome, you know, but the director, well, we'll get to that, but yeah, when ESPN turned down the idea that I pitched to them about making a documentary film, um, it ignited the switch in me to say, no, we need to make this film. And if ESPN is not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so I went out on my own and I crowdsourced this film, you know, through um, Indiegogo, which is like Kickstarter. And uh -huh. we built a budget to make this film happen. And I hired a cinematographer to obviously do all the stuff that I don't know how to do, you know, the camera <laughs> shooting that you know all of that was just amazing um to to put together so you know long story short that happened and we got that done um uh you know two years later but during that process here i was thinking okay this is great now i'm on a pro team i'm shooting this film and this by the way it's it's obvious to anybody who watches the trailer and then watches the film that this is not a film about me this is not some vanity project. This is about women's cycling. But when we were making the film, the director of my team thought that I was making a movie about myself. And right. no matter yeah. what, I, I, I showed her the data, I showed her the, you know, the, the outlines, everything. I'm like, no, 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 it's not about me. Yes, I pop into it now and then, or my voice comes up to explain a situation, but it is absolutely not a film about me. And it's, you're, you'll see like Colavita is going to be all over this film in a positive way. And, but yes, of course we have to talk about problems and inequities. And she was of that mindset of like, no, if you talk about anything negative about cycling, we're going to lose sponsors. Mm -hmm. And my vision was like, no, no, no. We're going to actually attract the right sponsors who want to right. step up and be part of the solution, you know? Mm -hmm. um, she didn't see that. She didn't like it. And it's also a hard thing when you're trying to convince somebody of an idea, you know, the film was being made. It wasn't done. It wasn't finished. So trying to convince somebody about an abstract concept that's happening, not everybody has the ability to see that. And so I was thinking like, yay, a film about women and equality. Every woman is going to stand behind this. And I was absolutely amazed and enlightened yeah. and brought to this new sense of reality that sometimes that's not how it works. You know, there are <laughs> women who are like, keep it as it is. I like it the way it is. Don't make any, you know, waves. Don't rock the boat. So that was my director that year um, did not like that. And she, and this, by the way, it started in 2012. That was a great year, but it was 2013 that this director was like, you know, if you continue squawking about inequality, I will bench you. And sure enough, true to her word, she did. I raced once in 2013 with the team and I was benched for the rest of the season, um, which was so hard, so upsetting on a very but, personal level, you know? But didn't, didn't your teammates kind of wonder what was going on? Oh, and, I think and, some of them did um, wonder, but I also think that they were... Um, 
you know, looking out for their best interests too, in terms of like, well, if Catherine's on the outs, you know, that sucks, but I'm also, it's not my job or my role to intervene. And I don't blame them. They probably would have, mm -hmm. you know, would have seen, been seen as a boat rocker and didn't want to lose their, their contract. And, as, and that's very, very sad that it had to be that way. Um, Right. But I I understand, you know, um, if they didn't want to to interfere in that in that capacity. So I get it. I fully get it. I don't have any ill will or ill wishes. They were amazing athletes. Um, and I, you know, I did what I could individually that year. I could go and race at, at events that my team was not racing in. I could go as an individual member to some races, you know, not all of them, but some. And so I would jump in when I could, or I'd race in local events um and that was yeah it was tough it was a tough tough year but i knew it was the right choice to to keep moving forward and that maybe someday i would tell the whole story and you know and so i did <laughs> yeah do you find that um it was did it feel like a sacrifice at the end knowing so, that like you couldn't stop filming like, what if you stop filming and you told her, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to not continue working on the film. Would you put me back on the start line? Uh, or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I kind of wonder if she felt like it was um, interfering with performance, um, taking your attention away, which I mean, it's a project, right? Mm -hmm. Um yeah, well, that would have been great. It would have been having, it would have been awesome though to have an opportunity to prove that. Like, no, it's right. not taking away from my performance. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm doing okay, um, but I didn't even get a chance to, you know, to prove that. I don't look at it so much as a sacrifice. To me, I think very much that it was a choice. Um, well, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. That's you know. Um, was I the sacrificial lamb in her eyes? Absolutely. You know, she put me on the chopping block. Um, right. But I also, you know, like to believe that karma had my back in the end, because at the end of 2013, when they did drop me from this team, mm -hmm. I was, um, I was ultimately picked up by a better team that actually picked me up, not just for the talent element, but because I spoke my mind. And ah. because I was a rabble rouser in the right way, you know, mm -hmm. like, like activist John Lewis said, I, you know, I was good trouble, right? So um, that, that made me really happy. But of course, that, that's not something that you know is coming. So that right. interim of being dropped and left behind and wondering what's coming next, that was a really, really hard stretch, you know, mm -hmm. six, seven months of just being like, wow, I guess my career is over. This sucks, you know, um, but, but ultimately doing everything that I could on my element of training for a maybes, training for yeses, thinking that the right team is out there, you know, that was within my control. So that's what I did. And, yeah. uh, and it did work out in the end. Um, so, you know, that was, that was a high point. And by the way, um, I ended up having my best season at the age of 40 and 41. So, oh. you know, it's important that that also was a big hammer of smackdown on all of the doubters who said, you who think, or who used to think that women's athleticism ends in their oh. 30s, you know, like, oh no, no, you know, and I'm not the only one to prove that, but in endurance sports, women excel in their 30s and even early 40s. So I was mm -hmm. happy to be part of that statistic. <laughs> yeah, actually, I had my best year when I was 40. Mm -hmm. 40? It was 40. That's when I moved up to senior one, too. Yeah. No, I believe yeah. that's a big year. I Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, when you're working to try and get to that, that's that level because yeah. you know you don't want to i mean you can always get a license to race in that level but you don't really want to suffer in that level you want to be able to <laughs> get strong enough to be competitive in that level right. Right. um so and it you know it took four years 
Well, it's probably a little bit more than that. Um, oh yeah, but it felt more. good. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This type of success in endurance sports does not happen overnight. You, there's a lot of work that yeah put in behind the scenes to get, to get a body physically ready for that type of thing. You know, so yeah, anybody who's getting into cycling um, should find you know comfort as well as education and the fact that, yep, it's going to take you a good, you know, four years just to even get your bearings as well as your fitness to be at the top, you know? Oh my gosh. At least, at least, and, but at least, <laughs> at least. And, uh, you know, I tell people that I'm like, well, yeah, just wait for it. Don't mm -hmm. overdo it like in a year and you think you're going to get there, you <laughs> like right. pace yourself. And I look at some, I, I have a friend of mine, her name's Patty and she's like 65 and she's like killing it in cyclocross, nice. you know, at the world, you know, I'm like, ah, uh, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> There's That's... always, you know, <laughs> so it's so inspiring. And the age group stories are my favorites because that's the lifeblood of our sport. You know, mm. the pros are the icing on the cake in terms of achievement in that regard. But no, it's the age group athletes that are the reminders of like, look what we mortals can do. You know, I that's know. the great stuff. And I don't have to go to your, you know, like, I don't have to like mm -hmm. make it to that level. Exactly. So, so um, now, okay. So talk about the launch of the movie. Now that was a big undertaking, putting it all together, getting the right aspects, getting the right people to talk on film. And also like, what did it bring? Did it start like a whole movement um, towards getting women on the Tour de France tour? Cause that was your big motivator. Mm -hmm. Did the movie start that movement of the right people coming together to start the wheels moving? Yes. Um, having access to the, you know, the greatest of the greats. And for me in that generation, um, Emma Pooley was a multiple world champion and Olympic medalist. Marianne Voss, who is still currently racing, you know, again, multiple Olympic gold medalist and world champion. And then another friend of mine in endurance sports, uh, Chrissy Wellington, four-time Ironman world champion. Um, the four of us banded together to create La Tour Entier, okay. which means the, the whole tour in French, you know, and that's the pressure group that we started. Um, and uh -huh. the reason that we started this pressure group was because I interviewed all, all three of them for the film for Half the Road. And I asked everybody that I interviewed, and I interviewed a lot of women and men, um, I said, you know, do you want to see a women's race at the Tour de France? And all of them said yes. But specifically mm -hmm. when Marianne and Chrissy and Emma said yes, that's when the idea came together. And I was like, okay, now that the biggest powerhouses in the sport want to see this, and mm -hmm. even though I'm space dust compared to their superstar <laughs> ranks, space you know, dust. I'm the Come space on. dust, you know, but I can, <laughs> I can still drive the bus. I can drive this bus of progress. <laughs> you know? And that's the message I want people to take away too and stand is that we are all capable of affecting change. We don't have to be the gold medal winner. We can right. drive the bus of progress. You know, if we have the organizational <laughs> skills, my particular skill as a, as a writer was like, okay, I can put that to use in making this change happen. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when you get all, all parties involved coming together and say, yep, let's, let's saddle up and fight this together. So uh, it's because of the film that that paved the way to the petition that we launched in 2013 against, oh. not, you know, to the Tour de France race directors, but it wasn't just a petition of like, let women race, you know, it was a very <laughs> formulated, <laughs> put together it was a proposal it was a website it was a manifesto there was so much work behind the scenes to mm -hmm. make this happen um not just a bunch of women saying you should do this and like no we want to make this happen we want to be part of the journey and that's what really turned the corner for uh you know for making this change happen that petition went viral we became one of change.org's three most successful petitions that year 
And wow. yeah, it was awesome. And back then change.org was just a little bit harder to sign up for, to check off the box of signing a petition. Now yeah. anybody can do that. And it's great. You know, maybe at most you just enter your email address, but back then you had to like kind of, you know, enter sign stuff, everything away, sign I think. everything up. So to think <laughs> that we got almost a hundred thousand people willing to do all that, just to check the box of, yes, I want to see women at the Tour de France. That was a wow. big deal. Yep. So yeah. that went, that went viral, positive. We gained a meeting with the, the Tour de France and eventually we created La Course by Tour de France, which is huge. And I know that you haven't yet gotten to that part in the book. So I'm going to stop there. <gasps> no, yeah. that's okay. I was still going to read it. <laughs> yeah, you better. you better. But okay. So is, okay. So now you've got four of you powerhouses moving together. Mm -hmm. This is like, um, 2014. Yeah. And I always think like, it's funny how sometimes there are always these individuals who have the same idea yeah. and nobody makes a correlation together. So nothing ever happens. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, um, that's yeah. actually very important because it's one thing to have great ideas. It's another thing to put them into action. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes any, a big, no. sometimes the biggest thing is like, what do you do to put it into action? Like, right. You know, if anything, that's where I was able to, yeah. to make that happen. Um, you know, and Marianne is a perfect example. She was, you know, like reigning world champion in, in 2013. And she was very, very honest and upfront and said, I am in this, I am fully supportive of everything that, that you're doing. Um, I also have to prioritize my race schedule. So I'm going to need, right. you know, you three to, you know, to take the helm of creating the organizational aspect. And yes, I'm all in, but I'm not going to be able to be on every call on every right. back and forth on every this and that. And yeah, yeah. that's what made it work together. Cause we were mm -hmm. all able to sit down and say, what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? What can I do? Right. And well, yeah, split it up. You split it up, you split it up and you make it work. And, um, and, and that's how we made it happen. And Marianne was there at every juncture that we needed her. And, um, you know, she put in a lot of effort as well as everybody on that, that committee. So it does take somebody though saying like, okay, I'm in and I will help be the organizer for this. And, it, but that was a very special group that everyone was so very, very adamant that this is a change that we need to see made. So mm -hmm. I'm going to throw this out there to anybody who is interested in affecting change. Um, I have to tell you that the, the main thing to do is organize with a group of like-minded people. However, mm -hmm. keep that group small. I have watched some groups open it up to the masses, you know, and they've got a committee of like 20 plus people and nothing gets done because somebody always thinks somebody else is doing it. Um, and when you can concentrate that effort into two, three, four, as your core group, that's enough. And that's where, um, that's where stuff is really gonna happen. And each of those two to three to four people have a stake of, of um, time commitment and ownership, it, it all works. Uh, mm -hmm. And then later, of course, like I said, we had 100,000 people sign that petition. So I consider them teammates as well. But can you imagine if I tried to include all of those people in oh, God. emails or this or that, or just vaguely say, hey, can anyone help with this? Like nothing would get done. <laughs> all right. You got to concentrate your efforts. But again, if I can do it, so can anybody. You know, I wasn't famous. I wasn't wealthy. Yes, I was a pro cyclist. Yes, I was a journalist, but it's not like the world knew my name. So mm -hmm. um, I made some cool stuff happen and I was space dust. <laughs> well, they know your name now, Catherine Burton. <laughs> maybe sometime. Burton, maybe someone Burton. knew. <laughs> Burton. <laughs> there you go. It's French. Um, so, you know, the French Canadian side, they'll know. <laughs> yes. I should put that little twang in there. Yeah. Seeing that I'm Quebec. Yeah, there you better. go. Um, okay, so you've got the four of you. You're moving forward now. Okay, there's. You got home stretch there. That's a personal mm -hmm. project of yours. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, it's a business now, but yes, it was a project and an idea. That, yeah, let's yeah. just put it, put aside the team you four. Let's talk about little uh, short, quickly about how Homestretch came about. Um, yeah. And the process, because I hear that you have to apply to get in there. Um, right. Not everybody can. Is this Homestretch where you live right now? I'm in the you? guest house of, of Homestretch. So I kind of have my own life that's off to the side of it, but right. I am on the premise of it. So Homestretch is a foundation that helps uh, female pro athletes that struggle with the gender pay gap. Hopefully once that pro that's that gap is equal at the end of 2023, you know, Homestretch can be absorbed into some other project out there, but right now we are helping those who need that assistance. And so uh, yeah, it's an application-based process where um, anywhere from eight to even 12 athletes can, eight to 10 athletes can live on premise and continue to train and race and base themselves here. And they don't have to pay for any rent or utilities or anything um, if they're accepting it into the program. So I know it's wow. been helpful, you know, getting a lot of these athletes um, to the next level of their cycling. Yeah, career. for you sure. How to do it. And it was a labor of love. It came about from the fact of, that I struggled not having the correct mm -hmm. income during those years. And so I thought maybe I can help shift the balance and then work behind the scenes to get a base salary in place. And so I feel very fortunate that we've been able to check that ladder box and say, all right, got it so done. Is that, a, is that a charity that you set up? So it's a nonprofit that is, foundation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and we, donations a, only. Oh or yeah. How does, that, how does that work? Yeah. Oh, please. By all means. Yeah. You better talk to, about uh, that. <laughs> right. To homestretchfoundation.org and feel free to donate to your heart's content. Um, I love being transparent that all of the donations, where it goes is to the carrying costs of the house, you know, right. so from everything from utilities to mortgage, et cetera. Um, that's where the donations go so that these women don't have to absorb that cost. And let's not forget that it's in gorgeous Tucson, Arizona. Yep. And it's based everybody on wants to be there. Yeah, so. it's it's here because we know that those fall and winter and spring training months are really important. And we see an influx of pro cyclists in Tucson every year. So that is why we based it here. It's the From right the place East Coast, it. no doubt. Or like yes. up north. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know, half of our applicants are Canadian. So. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It makes me very happy. We've had amazing women, like you mentioned, Emily Flynn, Lex Albrecht. We've had tons of Canadians through the program and just amazing women. So it makes me really happy. All right. Perfect. So remember that homestretchfoundation.org. Yeah. Okay. So I love Phoenix, Arizona. So uh, next time I'm down there, I'm going to have to come and go riding with you. Well, I'm in Tucson, I, so you're going to have to drive down. I know. Tucson. Don't worry. I'll drive down. I'll drive down. Yeah. I'll get my bike and I'll drive down there. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Love it. So, uh, yeah, I was like, wow, no way. Cool. Um, so now that you've got, let's go to the, okay, the book. Because yeah. the book is everything compilated together from the start to, I'm guessing, the end. And that's why I was like, oh, my God, I got to get to the end to find out how the story finishes. And yeah. then I saw an announcement that the female Women's Tour de France is coming next year. Yeah, exactly. So we're really excited that the... Um, uh, that happened did you have a hand in that? Oh yeah. You Is know, that just, part of the, so that's the part of the four of you girls going together. And so how did it all fit together? Like with so the, the book, four, you guys. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so Sylvie, that, um, that's a very long story. Okay, uh, and well, I know no, that we're, we're kind of already, we're well past our 75 minutes. So I'm, I'm afraid that I'll have to, to bump that one over to the book. And I'm hoping that people will find stands, you know, and get the full story okay, yeah. there. But I will comment that, yeah, um, you know, we, we created La Course by Tour de France with, with ASO. And um, it was in our entire plan that yes, they would grow the race incrementally over the years. 
And they kept it as one day for, for roughly seven years. And with all the pressuring behind the scenes of saying enough, enough, you now need to fulfill your promise and make us, yeah. you know, an elongated stage race. So that is coming in 2022. I'm thrilled about it. You know, um, it's, it's a huge, huge step of progress. Will it be a full three weeks equal to the men? No, not yet, but we need to still celebrate this progress and keep the pressure on of asking, okay, great. And when does the rest of it come? When does the rest of it happen? So that's our job. Is it going to be like a week? It's rumored to be eight to 10 days right now. Oh, okay. But we won't officially know until October. Uh, maybe, maybe they'll let a press release out sooner, but that is the plan. That is still a good start. Like if you do good half mm-hmm. and good then, start. and then do the, yeah. It's I mean, start. still, because all you need is 10 days of good publicity and people watching it and raving oh, about yeah. it oh, to yeah. bring in the other half, you know, like the year after. Wow. Congratulations. Oh my gosh. Yes. I know we've been chatting along. So get the book, read the story, get completely enthralled in the whole, like everything. Um, and now I'm like, Oh my God, I got to find out the how everything came together. Um, and yeah, so, Oh my gosh. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this episode i know it was long i hope it was good (laughs) we both want um to know your biggest takeaway and if you have feedback or if you just want to like shout us out on social media Catherine and sylvie and (laughs) actually i'm just gonna have to just hold on there i'm gonna have to get a picture i just i turned my phone and I don't know how to screenshot on this thing. <laughs> oh, what do you have? Are you on a Mac? No, I want to work um, a, uh, I don't know, a, a word like. Um, okay. Not on no, Mac. I'm not sure how to screenshot it, but I'll, I'll sit still while you take a picture. Okay, hold on. <laughs> and um, so what we'd love to see are you guys uh, sharing this episode passing it around. This goes straight in, you know, with the Women's Tour de France, uh, talking about Catherine, talking about the book, um, giving us a review and also five stars um, on iTunes. And uh, just thank you so much for listening, Catherine. Oh my gosh, we need to do this again. Like, thank you. Maybe like in January, you know, like the new year and we're getting or like somewhere like getting rolling when everybody starts talking about Tour de France, maybe like in March, you know, that's going to, when everybody starts cycling and, and uh, you know, outside and everything. Sounds like a plan. (laughs) All right. All right. Okay. So let's just finish it up here. Um, Anyways, I could say goodbye for like ever. I'm like, well, bye, bye, bye. (laughs) But and thank I'm, you I'm so like, much. okay, gotta go. Bye. I know. <laughs> I'm like, bye. I know you got it down pat. All right. Thanks, everyone. Don't disappear yet, Catherine. Okay. Um, but we'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Sylvie.